dedicated to each and every one of you who appreciate a great glass of wine. You know what I mean? It's Monday. Let's raise a glass to the beginning of another week. It's time to unscrew, uncork, or savor a bottle. And let's begin exploring the wine glass. Today is a best of episode. This episode was originally recorded in 2020 and had some incredible downloads, so I thought I would share it again. Slancha. No, no, no. This one is dedicated to each and every one of you who appreciate a great glass of wine. You know what I mean? It's Monday. Let's raise a glass to the beginning of another week. It's time to unscrew, uncork, or savor a bottle, and let's begin exploring the wine glass. Today, I am sharing with you a Zoom event I attended about Bordeaux terroir. Terroir is defined as the complete natural environment in which a particular wine is produced, including factors such as the soil, topography, and climate. It also relates to the characteristic taste and flavor imparted to a wine by the environment in which it is produced. Bordeaux is a very regulated wine region and I am a believer that you can taste their soils in the glass. Whether you are in a left or right bank, within the AOCs there are differences that present themselves in the glass. Join me as I learn more about the soils of Bordeaux in this seminar presented by Benchmark Wine. Please take a moment to swipe to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. And don't forget to tell your wine-loving friends about exploring the wine glass. Hey everybody, I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program, Psalm Day Service, and WSET Level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials, as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time to swipe, subscribe, rate, and review. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. First, I would like to introduce Wendy Narby, who is one of our Bordeaux experts. Um, who has been on webinars in the past, so hopefully you know her, but um, hi, Wendy. Hi. Hi, thank you very much, Shelley. So, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be behind the scenes answering questions. So um, now I am so thrilled to introduce Jane Anson, who really doesn't need an introduction. If you've ever Googled any topics on Bordeaux, uh, you're sure to have found her work um, and her writings. Jane is a contributing editor uh, and Bordeaux expert for Decanter, and she's also an author. Her most recent book is Inside Bordeaux. Um, I have my copy here. As I like to say, it's my uh, quarantine uh, companion, <laughs> the best one I've had. So um, Jane, without further ado, I'd love to pass it off to you and welcome. Thank you. Thanks so, so much for asking me to, to be with you this evening. Um, it is for us um, seven o'clock at night in Bordeaux. As you can see, it's nighttime. We really, really feel like winter is coming in in Bordeaux. So, um, so yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, I, one of the reasons why I was asked to talk about terror is because it's one of the main themes that I talk about in Inside Bordeaux in the book that you've just seen. And David Pernay, who I have asked to join us tonight, was part of the scientific advisory team for the book because what I tried to do was to take all of the research that had been out there about terroir and Bordeaux, as this is one part, of, one part of the book of how I'm trying to approach in a kind of a new way, talking about Bordeaux chateaus. And I, you know, I went to the Earth because I really wanted to translate what was out there for those of us who are not soil scientists, who are not um, you know, the, 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 the uh, agricultural engineers, and to try and make sense of what does all of this mean in the glass? What does it mean for those of us who want to actually drink Bordeaux wine and choose different kinds of Bordeaux wine? So, so David, very, very kindly, was part of, of that team of, of experts. Now, he is um, a consultant. He's an agricultural engineer. He's a consultant here. And I think, David, almost 20 years ago now, you founded your own consultancy business. I think yes, 2000, exactly. is that right? Nine, nine, 19, exactly. 19. <laughs> so um, that's called So Viva. And he works across across Bordeaux with many different estates, but um, he does a lot of audits of, and analysis of different vineyards. So often, when when he starts, you tell us about this. But when you start with a client, one of the things you'll do is actually get out into the vineyard and see what's happening. Could we actually start off with you just telling us a bit about that process? 
what does what, what what does a client normally ask you and what do you what do you do right in fact um, people uh, ask us um, some some help uh, for different reasons it can be uh, to become uh, organic it can be uh, to 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 increase uh, the quality of their of their wine to to um, to have a better uh, um, understand of their um, of their terroir. Anyway, um, uh, uh, the, the, the way we 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 have to, to proceed is first to understand the specification of the place uh, of each place uh, each property, because um, it's uh, um, it's our way to to to, to see uh, um, wine uh, and uh, it's 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 the case in Bordeaux. It's to to um, to to up uh, the property to produce um, a, a wine which is uh, really specific to um, the place he, uh, it is produced. And um, it's first, it's to understand the specification of the terroir, uh, to, to know uh, the geologic aspect in each part of the vineyard, to know the, the evolution of each uh, substrate, geological substrate, to know which kind of soil, if it's some soil very young or very evaluated. And all this aspect will lead to some specification, uh, um, uh, some specific, some characteristic uh, uh, on, on the wine. And uh, it's our goal, our target to, to have the, the best way to produce grapes and then for the vinification um, to, um, make uh, clear this link between the wine uh, characteristic and the, the soil from uh, where it uh, comes. Okay, thank you. That's brilliant. So that's just to give an overview of, of, what, of, of what it means today to be a soil scientist. So I thought that I would take you guys through a bit of a presentation about what does it mean? What does terroir mean in Bordeaux today? And as I go, I'm going to ask David questions and, and bring him in at certain points. And we'll do this for, it'll be about 40 minutes or so. And, and then we're going to hand it over to, to questions from you guys. And yeah, do ask as many questions as possible, be as specific as possible. David is truly, truly a, an expert. It's such a great opportunity to have him here to, to ask questions. So one of the things that, that I, when I started off doing this book, I wanted to look at Bordeaux as it is today. I wanted to look at what was changing and I, I, I couldn't escape from the fact that 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, people weren't really taking the idea of terroir seriously in Bordeaux. And I don't mean the winemakers or the consultants. I mean, those of us who are looking at Bordeaux from the exterior, what we're used to thinking is that Bordeaux is about big brands. And it's one of the things that is really exciting in the region today is that it's taking ownership of its terroir in a way that I think it hasn't necessarily done previously. So if I just start by saying, what does it mean? Um, I can remember being at, a, at a, a conference about organic wines about six years ago. And every, there, there were people from Spain, from Italy, from Southern France, from Burgundy. There was nobody from Bordeaux there. And when the name Bordeaux was mentioned, there, you could, there was an audible kind of laughter in the room about the idea that Bordeaux could have terroir. And it really kind of made me cross but living here and knowing that that's not the case and really kind of crystallized to me a lot of this approach that I wanted to, to, to do in Inside Bordeaux. So historically, Bordeaux has not necessarily been its best champion in terms of, of terroir. Um, we look at the region's flagship classification, which is 1855. It wasn't ranked according to the the type of soil, it was ranked according to, to the price that the chateaus had gained in the marketplace. Now, I, uh, there's no question that part of the reason it had, they had gained that price was because of where they were located and because of the soils which they made the land, made the wine, but that wasn't the image that was given. So, um, and, and the brand is classified in 1855. So what that means is Lafitte Rothschild may have been you know, 50 or 60 hectares in 1855. Um, in fact, you can see it's 74 hectares in 1855, but it's able to increase in size to, bu to buy other parts of land from around Poyac and still call them Lafitte. They are actually very careful about not putting all of that in the first wine, but again, it gives the impression that 
Bordeaux is more about um, brands than it is about soils. Santa Million over on the right bank, Santa Million does, as part of its classification, does include questions of terroir. So in fact, um, Angelus or Ozone, they are, have special parts of their vineyard which are classified. And if they do buy more land within Santa Million, that actually does not automatically go into the classified part. They're allowed to ask next round, because that's every 10 years, um, they're allowed to ask for it to be included, but it's not automatic. But they also include things like car parking and tourism. So that again, kind of dilutes this message of terroir. Okay, and again, <laughs> moving on from that, there are other things that work against Bordeaux in the idea of terroir. And one of them is that you don't have, in, Bur in Burgundy, it's you know, fairly simple. You have a part of land, a, a, a designated plot, which, which, is locate, which is corresponding to one designated wine. And then if there's another wine, it's called something different entirely from a different plot. Whereas what happens in Bordeaux is you have first wine, second wine, sometimes third wines. And again, this image for consumers is, can that, can, can that really be from, can, can it be one estate with one terroir if you have so many different named wines from the same estate? Um, what often happens in Bordeaux is that the owners may live in, in Paris or they live um, wherever, um, but then it's have a director in charge of vineyards. The wine, the owners often make financial decisions, but they don't make decisions about the orientation of the vineyard rows or the exact grape variety mix. You know, that they, what they do is they ask experts like David, they ask experts like their, um, their, their viticulturalist or their, or, or, or et cetera. But it, 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 again, it doesn't, it doesn't give the image of a man and his wine or a woman and her wine close to the land in the way that you feel it in places often like, like Burgundy. Again, appellation system doesn't always help. You have the two big appellations in Bordeaux are AOC Bordeaux, AOC Bordeaux Superior, and they make over half of all of the production of the region, and yet they can be from anywhere. So I have a, a little map of Bordeaux behind me. Um, you can see lots of different colors, which are corresponding to all of the different appellations, but AOC Bordeaux or AOC Bordeaux Superior can actually come from any of those colors. You can choose, you, you don't in theory, but you can, choose to make it wherever you are and there are certain big stretches where you where you have to if you're making a red wine um again sales system the sales system here tends to go through a, a negotiant you have a broker and a negotiant and what that means is that between the winemaker and the final consumer there are three different layers and it can even if you are very carefully making your wine according to terroir and you're organic or biodynamic or etc it's not you normally who is telling the consumer that. So it can kind of give you this gap, which doesn't necessarily help Bordeaux in terms of its, its image of being close to the land. Um, and finally on, on this slide, um, there are less winemakers now than there were 10 years ago. And the reason for that is because the states are getting bigger. And again, if the states are getting bigger, that there's a question over how, how, true, to, to, how true to terroir, the, the traditional view of terroir can they be. And my final thing before we get on to why, yes, we absolutely should believe in Bordeaux de Terroir, is that this is a blended wine. So the vast, vast majority of Bordeaux wines are not from a single grape variety. They tend to be from vineyard holdings that extend you know, 40, 50, 100 hectares with a ton of different soil types. And the grapes are planted mainly according to soil type, but also partly, certainly historically, because of Appalachian typicity. And what I mean by that is, for a long time, AOC Listrac in the Medoc planted a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon because that was a fashionable grape to have in the Medoc. That happened a lot in the 70s and the 80s. And it's only now that they're going back to planting a bit more Merlot because they're, the lot of the land there actually works much better for, for Merlot. If you look back in history to when Listrac was first became an AOC, then they did have a lot of Merlot as well because at the time they were looking for what was working in that appellation. But over time, the kind of fashionable side of Cabernet Sauvignon overtook. So that can kind of take away from this idea of matching soil to, to grape variety. That has very much changed now. And then you have sometimes owners who particularly liked a certain grape. So the Miao family, there was a guy um, in the middle of the 20th century who loved Merlot. So if you go to Siran, to Pichon Contest, to Palmer, that family owned those estates. 
and all three of those estates have more Merlot than a lot of their neighbours. And that was partly because he loved that grape. So, so all of those things don't always help. However, there has been a real change since really the last two decades in terms of, in terms of ensuring that Bordeaux is really up to date in, in, in terms of matching those things, matching soil to, 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 to a great variety. But terroir is a lot more than that. And I'm going to head back over to David here because this, um, this kind of uh, description of terroir here, a cultivated ecosystem in which the vine interacts with soil and climate, that comes from one of um, David's um, colleagues, uh, Kays van Leeuwen, who's a professor here. So I would like to just head over to David and, and ask you, how would you describe terroir? What does terroir actually mean for, for in Bordeaux? Uh, first, uh, when we speak about terroir in um, a, one re a defined rain, re rain region, it's more about soil because uh, we um, think that climate is homogeneous and the way people are proceeding and the, the vineyard structure is quite homogeneous. So when we speak of terroir in a region as Bordeaux, it's more about uh, soil specification geologic specification, more than about uh, practices uh, or even more about uh, um, uh, climate. Even if uh, we know that uh, some parts of Bordeaux area are more earlier, um, early writing than other, um, all the parts which are close uh, from the river are um, earlier um, writing than uh, other parts, more um, uh, on the west side or more inside uh, in the northeast of uh, the region, the Bordeaux region. So, but it's mainly about soil. And even we can talk about early soil and late soil. Um, the more the soil takes time to warm up in spring, the more the, um, um, the, red, the um, cycle, the wine cycle, the vine cycle will be long. And so it will make it take more time for the so for the berries to 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 be uh, uh, properly ripened. So, um, so by that you mean a, a cooler soil. Sorry. But by, by that you mean a cooler. So a cooler soil yes, will take soil longer. Take, take more time. First, to for the the bud burst, and then even for the ripening. Um, so the so two main things that makes um, earlier cycle. It's first the 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 ability of the soil to warm up, and then the ability of the soil to um, um, induce some hydric stress on the vines. Because hydric stress yeah. is, a, is a, the, the most important variable to make the tannin uh, soft. And the more you have some hydric stress um, in moderate situation, um, the more uh, the tannin will be soft. That's why uh, tannin um, will be soft and um, in a, in short time. That's why um, if we talk about uh, um, terroir, um, different terroir, we can define three main uh, situation. Um, the oldest one is some limestone, uh, some the, the, the basement of uh, all the, the area. You can have some soils um, developed directly on this limestone uh, on the right bank, uh, especially on Saint Emilion, on the top part of Saint Emilion. Uh, you have to, to know that uh, you can have some oldest soil, oldest um, uh, geologic uh, substrate on higher parts. So it is the case in Saint Emilion. In Saint Emilion, the top part of Saint Emilion is. Uh, um, uh, that's where we find the oldest uh, geologic substrate. So it's uh, um, uh, Asteri uh, limestone. And um, it's um, some soil which are quite um, cold because there's some uh, high level of um, clay inside. And so the more you have some clay, the more the soil will fix water and the more it will take time to, to, to warm up. Mm -hmm. And um, so this limestone is able to release some water for the ripening season. And so it makes um, uh, some very moderate, low to moderate hydric stress. So it makes times um, 
uh, vines will take times to, to, to have some very uh, well ripened tannin and so soft tannin. On the opposite, you have the gravelly soil, which are closer to the river because they came from the deposit of the river uh, at the opposite of the first one, which were um, uh, deposit uh, on the um, uh, under um, sea uh, under the sea. Uh, so and, and so the, the gravel the gravel uh, have been uh, de deposit from uh, from the river, and so it was. Uh, so there, there's different terraces uh, defined. So from a bit more one million years ago to uh, uh, one hundred uh, thousand years ago. And so these gravelly soils, first, they were very, it was gravel, gravel with sand. Uh, thanks to some old part, um, old period uh, with very hot condition, the top part of the gravel terraces had been uh, destroyed by the trop tropical condition. This tropical condition destroyed the, the more um, sensitive uh, gravel and they release some clay. So it makes uh, on this top part of uh, gravelly soil, some very compact mix of uh, sand, gravel and clay, very um, uh, compact like concrete for summer times. And in this soil, it's very difficult for the roots to, to get uh, inside. And so they are very sensitive to hydric stress. And on, this, on these soils, which are um, in which we have a lot of gravel, a lot of um, uh, porosity. Um, the soils get warm uh, very early in spring. So first aspect of uh, earliness. And then um, vines uh, will have uh, more hydric stress for the ripening season. And it is a second aspect for earliness because um, this hydric stress will make tanning um, become soft earlier. So yeah. that's why we have um, and you have understand to, to understand that um, time between verizon and harvest is uh, very short on this uh, type of soil. And we have to be uh, more prescient uh, on the first type of soil on the limestone because it makes more time for the tanning to become uh, soft. So if we, have, if we maintain the same time uh, between verizon and, and harvest on these two types of soil. On the second type, uh, on the limestone soils, we will have some um, uh, rusticity, some coarse tannin. And so we have to, 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 to be more patient, to take, uh, to make, to take more time to, to, to be rapid. That's brilliant. That's a very, very clear description. And what that also tells me is there is a human element to terroir. I mean, it's important for, to kind of bear that in mind. There is a human element to it because um, there are people making those those choices. You know what you do with your terroir makes a difference. So yes, yeah, so we're about to go and look at how Bordeaux is. You know what are the different um, geological things that we're looking at. So we have a poll question first of all for you guys. Um, what what do you think? Where do the lowest spots of the Bordeaux vineyard sit? Do you think they are at sea level? Are they fourteen meters or are they twenty meters? So the lowest. The lowest. Uh, oh, don't worry, David, you don't do it. This is for the people who are watching. <laughs> don't give it away. <laughs> okay, cool. So we have got 53% at sea level. And then, okay, great. Well done, everybody. You are correct. There, there, most of it starts at 14, but they're 14 meters, but there are one or two vineyards which are literally right along the river edge. There's one called um, La Vieille Chapelle, which is on the right bank quite near to Fronzac, it's in Appalachian AOC Bordeaux, Bordeaux Soup, but it's um, yeah, quite near to Fronzac and it's right along the water's edge. And one of the fascinating things about that place is that there are some pre phylloxera vines. There are some vines that have been there since the end of the 19th century, which they are only just today finding out what the grape varieties are. They've just done some DNA testing to properly identify the grapes, which they thought were Merlot, but they turn out to be I forget what exactly now, but a, but a, a much, much older um, grape. And the reason that they have survived that long is because it was at sea level. And so it flooded during phylloxera, um, which was one of the things that people tried to do. And it didn't work on any kind of a major scale. But because they were naturally down there and they were naturally in, a, in an area that could flood, 
then their vines and um, those that particular um, plot of old vines survived. So fascinating. Um, so I'm just going to talk you through a little bit about what we're dealing with with this map behind. What, what exactly we're we looking at? Bordeaux is about four, or four, probably about four times the size of Burgundy, a little bit more. But it is the largest fine wine region in France, as you all know, of course. But if you actually break down, what does that mean? So 213 kilometres north to north to south, 105 kilometres um, east to west. Now, I here have 114,000 hectares as of 2016, but even since then, in the last four years, that has actually gone down a little bit more. I think today we're on just over 110,000, maybe 111,000, um, because they are do, um, pulling up parts of the Bordeaux region which they don't think are good enough quality. So they're really trying to refocus to ensure that what you're getting when you buy Bordeaux is this much more consistent quality. So, so that has gone down, but actually, I think over the last two years, it's really stabilized. So, we, so we're probably gonna stay at about 110,000. Um, there are 65 different appellations. And as um, David was, was very clearly showing us, those are different appellations have very different soil types. Now, my own personal feeling is the reason for years that we didn't really talk about terroir in Bordeaux is because it's so complicated. There are so many different um, kind of parameters to go by. So if we just talk here, what are the basics? What are the things that we all are told when we first learn about Bordeaux? Clearly, left bank versus right bank. Now, those, those things that David was talking about in terms of the late ripening, the early ripening soils, generally speaking, you have the gravel versus the clay. Sorry, so we've got the two rivers, the Garonne, which kind of is the backbone, going mainly to marking out the left bank. And then you have the Dordogne, which um, is mainly you know, marking out the right bank. They, they meet about Margot. So about Bly on the right-hand side and Margot on the left-hand side is pretty much where those two rivers meet. And then it heads off to the sea. Um, and then this idea of gravel versus clay. Gravel is mainly left bank, clay mainly right bank. This is again what we're told when we're first learning about Bordeaux. And then we're also learning Cabernet Sauvignon, mainly left bank, Merlot, mainly right bank. And we're told it's, it's all about brands and, it's, and Bordeaux is designed to talk about either good vintages or bad vintages. So that is your kind of 101, here you are, this is what we're gonna know about Bordeaux. So let's go on to our next slide and see what, what really happens. So this really is what um, David was talking about. The two different banks are different geological ages, exactly as he said, there are some soil types which are much older than others. They're different heights. The left bank is much lower than the right bank. The right bank goes right up to 140 meters about. The right bank, the meadow only goes up to 35 meters maximum. You have Soten that goes up to about 75 meters. So, you know, but it is generally speaking much lower than, than the right bank. And then you have this kind of body of, of land which sits in between the two rivers, which is called Entre de Mer. If it was called Entre de Riviere, it might be much clearer for everybody who's learning about Bordeaux, but basically it means it's between the Dordogne and the Garonne. And then again, as, as um, just breaking down as what David was telling us, you have the, um, these different soil types that are coming partly from the Pyrenees Mountains, really coming down from the Garonne, partly from the Massif Central in the middle of France, which goes down the Dordogne River, and you get dozens or hundreds of, of soil types. And we're told that you know, Cabernet Sauvignon is the king of Bordeaux, but actually the reality when you look is that Merlot is 66% of the planting. It's a, a, it's a lot, um, it covers a lot of, of Bordeaux, but it's becoming more complicated. We will talk about climate change uh, later. We'll talk about the impact that different terroir has on climate change. And the, and the re reality of Bordeaux vintages is it's absolutely not good or bad. They're reflecting the complexities of these different soil types with different grape varieties and, and what works best where. And personally, I like to think about vintages as, you know, is it an early drinking vintage? Is it an, a long aging vintage? Is it a vintage which favors cooler areas? Is it a vintage which favors the warmer early ripening areas? So the, this is, um, you know, the, the stuff that becomes really fascinating, I think. And what I love as well, when you start to look at the actual reality, the detail of Bordeaux terroir, is that you realize it isn't just clay right bank, um, gravel left bank. And what you start finding 
are these really unusual areas that can give you really wonderful, delightful wines that you maybe wouldn't have, have thought about or you wouldn't know why they taste the way they do until you start to make sense of the terroir that they're sat on. So again, we thought left, left bank or gravel. In fact, there's plenty of limestone, there's plenty of clay over on the left bank. And there's a, a couple of areas. This, there's an area here called Pujol, which is near to Sauterne, but this is a dry white wine because there's a lot of limestone. There's really a, a, a beautiful plateau of limestone, limestone Pujol sur Serran. And there's a fantastic um, white wine, which I recommend you trying if you can do, which is called Clos Floridaine. And that um, has, you know, it's a really a limestone based, a brilliant, brilliant Sauvignon Blanc that's worth trying just to see what good white, good white you can make. And in fact, um, I'm going to ask David in a moment, but just a little bit further south from there, you've got the Appalachian of Sauterne, which is known for its sweet wines, but there is some brilliant, brilliant limestone in Barsac. Barsac is one of the communes of the Sauterne Appalachian. And Barsac is packed full of great limestone and could, I'm absolutely sure, make really well, does already make some brilliant white wines. And we're seeing more and more dry whites coming out of Sauterne because people are willing more than they were maybe historically to look at their terroir and think, what actually is this best suited for? How can I make the most of it? Um, and uh, I was speaking with Kay Van Leeuwen, who's uh, one of David's um, colleagues recently, and his suggestion is that there could be fantastic reds made in Sauten because, or, or in, um, in, in, in Basak, sorry, because there's limestone. And you think about Santa Millian, Santa Millian has a lot of really astonishing, great red wines made on limestone. So anyway, so this um, slide, which you guys may get, I'm not sure if you'll see it afterwards, but there are parts of the Medoc which have clay, you'll find 100% Merlot in some parts of, of the Medoc. And the further you go up north in the Medoc, closer towards the ocean, you again get great white wines. Um, over on the right bank, we think of it all being clay, but you have a lot of gravel. You have gravel over, and it's not a lot actually, but you have spots of gravel. Um, you've got very famously Figiac and Cheval Blanc in saint Millian, which are among a sea of clay and um, limestone. And they have this really very beautiful um, clay and gravel soils, which, which make their very particular and, and incredible wines. Um, so yes, yeah, so David, is that something that you find uh, as, a, as a consultant, as somebody who does terroir studies, is that kind of for you a, a fun part of your job to find these unusual spots? Uh, yes, um, but um, before um, finding some unusual, unusual spot, it's uh, more to understand why, um, for example, in Saint Estef, uh, you you have some uh, when you, you you sink to left bank, for example, from Margot to 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 Saint Estef, um, you you can see that. Uh, um, ge geologically, you you will find some mainly some gravel on all the, the left bank. When as you you told you you will see that uh, more you go in the north, more you you will have some uh, important surface in uh, on limestone. But before this surface on limestone, you have the basement of the gravelly soil, which will be with heavy clay which are so important in some properties as uh, Chateau Latour or Chateau Cos d'Estournel. And um, on this property, uh, uh, even if the, um, uh, the main part of the, um, of the blend is uh, Cabernet Sauvignon on, on gravelly soils, uh, it's, uh, this Merlot on heavy clay is really um, a part of their signature. And uh, to understand precisely where these heavy clay are uh, situated, um, if they are part, partially covered by, by gravel or some, or some sand, which part uh, will it be more the, the, the heavy clay which will um, uh, define the way the vine, the, the vine will be behave? Uh, it's some things which are really uh, important to define the way first the type of um, um, vegetal material you have to plant, I mean, to define the rootstock, the right rootstock, which will lead to the right level of figure thanks to this type of, of uh, substrate, um, to define the right um, uh, varieties, because 
if you plant, um, even if you are on south exposed um, um, uh, slope, uh, if you plant some Cabernet Sauvignon on this heavy clay, you will have um, um, most of the time not so good results than you will have uh, with, with Merlot. So before uh, finding new situation, great situation, it's more about to uh, well understand vine behavior in each point uh, of the, the property to adapt to have the, the, the best way to, um, uh, to technically um, define the process from planting to the vinification uh, adapted to the specification of, um, of uh, each soil we, we can find. And now, a word from our sponsor. Dracaena Wines loves to give back. There are so many fur babies that deserve to find their forever home. We would love to be able to help as many as possible. If you are part of a nonprofit organization or know of a nonprofit organization that would like to hold a fundraiser, please contact us at contact at dracinawines.com or visit our website, dracinawines.com, to fill out the form. How does the fundraiser work? It is super simple and costs your group absolutely nothing. Together, we will choose a month that your group will be sponsored. During the month, you promote the fundraiser just like any other event you'd hold. At the end of the month, we will donate 20% of the sales to your organization. The donations will be made in the name of each individual who purchased the wine so that you know exactly who helped the animals. Our goal is to raise as much funds as we possibly can and to help as many animals as possible. So please help us help as many fur babies as we possibly can. You're making such a, a brilliant point that I think is worth underlining for people listening. Um, you talk, you mentioned two estates there. You mentioned Cos d'Estonel and the Chateau Latour. Now, people who taste Bordeaux regularly, those are both estates which are known for having very dense, powerful, long aging wines. And, and they're often talked about in terms of their power. Now, I think it can be quite... Um, you know, you, you look at that and you might think that's a personal choice of the people who are making the wine there. But you make the brilliant point that they both have a lot of clay among their gravel. And when you have clay, what that often means is you have power naturally. And you can compare it. I, I often love to compare Lafitte against Latour because Lafitte has much, has huge amounts of gravel, deep gravel, but less clay than Latour does. And the, and the result that you get in the glass is that Lafitte tends to be a bit more understated, a bit more elegant, it takes its time, you've got to go to it in a, in a way that with Latour, it's, it's really very obviously structured, big tannins, it's, it's so majestic. And, it, it, and I think that when you actually start looking at the terroir, you start to understand why those personalities are so different. So I think, thank you for, for making that point. For example, um, it, it just to, to finish on this point, yeah. uh, the opposite for, for example, uh, in Margot Chateau Palmer, uh, it's um, one of the great uh, estates where you have very little surface with um, heavy clay. So it's really mainly, mainly topsoil on, on gravel. And we understand and we, we make a map of the hydric stress uh, on all the surface of the vineyard. And we can see that more than 80% of the, the vineyard, um, uh, on 80% of more than 80% of the vineyard, the vines have for um, nearly every vintage, some uh, at least moderate stress. Mm -hmm. And it's really uh, important to understand why on this estate, you have uh, one of the specification is to have always very uh, silky tannin. Uh, it's because of this um, uh, percentage of the surface with some uh, hydric stress uh, on every vintages, even on, on the um, most uh, uh, weight um, uh, vintages. Yeah, it's brilliant. I really do think that the more you kind of get into this and, and understand what's happening underneath, the more pleasure you take from the wines and from learning about them, because all of a sudden it, things start to fall into place. It's not just about them having had wealthy owners at the right time in their, in their history. It's actually, there's something that you can touch and feel and understand, and I love that. So the reason that we know more is, is related to this slide. So for those of you watching, I just tried to bring together here 
the terroir heroes? Who are the people that over the years should we thank for, you know, for us to learn a little bit more about Bordeaux? Um, obviously, we could go right, right, right back, but I start here with one of the most famous inc incidents or instances in Bordeaux of human intervention to improve terroir. And I picked one guy, there were many, but a guy called Jan Leeguwater, who is, was um, Dutch, and he was in Bordeaux in, in the 1700s. And he was part of a, a team of, of people, but he was one of the lead engineers who drained the Medoc. So he was brought as an, as an engineer to understand how to drain the Medoc. And if any of you have been to the Medoc, um, it's very, it's not, it's not entirely flat, but it's a relatively flat area and it's a relatively narrow kind of peninsula and you have the sea on one side and the river on the other. And for much of its life, most of it was, was under, not totally underwater, but there were kind of islands, croups. Um, David talked about the different um, gravel outcrops that there were in the, in the, in the left bank, there still are, very important for understanding quality on the left bank. But for much of the time in the Medoc, it was only really the tops of them that were exposed. Um, and when the Dutch came, as you all know, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but I just wanted to bring that, bring that point that he was the guy, or he represents that idea of intervention, draining the Medoc, exposing the gravel. Now, what happened then, my next terroir hero, a guy called Baron de Bran, who owned Mouton Rothschild for a while, he owned Bran Cantonat for a while. He was about at the same time, and what he did was he popularized the matching of Cabernet Sauvignon to that gravel. So particularly in, in Mouton first, but then he took it down to Bran Cantonac, he realized how good that combination was, which today, you know, is fetishized the idea of Cabernet Sauvignon and, um, and gravel. Everybody loves the idea of it. And he was basically, I, I read quite a few of the archives of Mouton, and he would tell a lot of his neighbors, plant Cabernet Sauvignon, it works in our soils. So he's really a terroir hero for me. And then I switched to the 20th century. So everyone that we've got here, um, Gerard Seguin, who was um, a, a researcher, a professor, was one of the first, as far as I'm aware, to do a full étude des sols, a study of Bordeaux soils, which was then published. It was part of a, a thesis that he did. He became he was a very, very long-standing professor at the university here. And he published really one of the first in-depth in studies of, of what, what are the different parts of Bordeaux like. Um, Lucien Lauton, he was an owner uh, in Margot, and during after the war, and in the 50s and 60s, and really even in the 70s, a lot of the estates in Margot, and I'm, this is again to represent other people doing the same thing in different appellations, but they had lost acreage. People had stopped looking after the vineyards, there wasn't money in it. Um, a lot of the, even the classified estates were losing, um, were, were almost went to nothing. Uh, and Lucien believed in the potential of Margot. He did an awful lot of kind of digging down himself to find the best parts of, of, of Margot and he replanted and he rebought. In fact, he bought a lot of the, of the best bits because he was able to, but he was important from the owner's side. And then my last four people I have here, including uh, David, um, are the guys who today are at the forefront. They're the, they're the um, soil scientists, they're the consultants, they're the terroir experts. Um, so Kays Van Leeuwen, Xavier Choney, David Bechelet and David Bene, who are really working very hard, either, if you look on, you know, either with, um, what do you call it, appellations with the CIVB or, or with um, individual chateaus to try and understand better terroir. And this is where I think we are today, modern terroir. It doesn't mean, it will never mean what it means in Burgundy of an individual tiny plot which is named individually and sold, you know, with a couple of hundred bottles. That isn't what Bordeaux is about, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't take terroir seriously. And it doesn't, you know, that there is so much to know here. And it's this idea. You're looking at the climate, you're looking at the temperature, you're looking at the soil, you're looking at the aspect, not just across the, the vineyard, but exactly as David was saying, today, what you're looking at is individual plots, individual rows. How does, how does, um, across Monroe's, which is 80 hectares or so, how does the, the vineyard change across the whole area? And therefore, how do we treat it differently? So even 15 years ago, you would have started harvesting from the left-hand side, finishing up on the right-hand side, just you know, going as, uh, as easily as you can. Today, that is the absolute antithesis of what happens. 
Today, they will be tracking individual ripening across the entire place, and they will be picking depending on what is needed. And, it, and it's more like a zigzag, you know, more like a dance than, than it was. And this I really love when we think about, if you look at the classified estates, and I actually think we have a question coming up about this. Um, if you look at the classified estates, they are not there by accident. So I'm gonna look just at 1855, just at the left bank. Now, David mentioned these, these, te these terraces. So there are six terraces as, as uh, David Bechelet, um, one of those terroir heroes um, has kind of identified and named them. And so their name, just to keep it simple, from Terrace 1 to Terrace 6. For most of the Medoc, you'll find mainly Terrace 3, Terrace 4, Terrace 5. And the totally unbelievable thing that actually kind of blows your mind when you start to look at it is that of the 61 1855 classified estates, they are all on either Terrace 3 or Terrace 4. And that is... When you, when I first kind of looked at that and realised it, it was so interesting because it just takes blows out the water this idea that they were only famous because they had wealthy owners. It really, really makes you think about the soil, the soil, the, the terroir. So, in fact, David, if you could bring us into here, you, you, this is um, four quality soil types as defined by by Kays van Leeuwen, and I'm certain you and and David Bechelet. So we're talking about the four quality soil types of Bordeaux. So could you just talk us a little bit through what does it mean in the glass to have deep clays? What does it mean to have gravels? And what does it mean to have limestone? Um, first, uh, so if we start with um, uh, all just one, um, so it is it will be the soft limestone, so we call it um, Bordeaux. To be fair to David, could we just keep up the definitions just so that he can see them while he's talking about them? So could we just go back to that last slide? Thank you. Okay, so the, the oldest one uh, on all of them, uh, it is uh, um, the soil for, for uh, Lassi de Cass. So it is uh, molas. Uh, it is uh, the soil you, you will find on the um, uh, south slopes uh, on the right bank, on Saint-Emilion, uh, also uh, in, uh, on, on Fronsac. Uh, or, Côte, or Côte de Castillon, so uh, it is uh, the, the south slopes uh, uh, of this, uh, this area. So it's a mix of um, um, uh, clay, um, silt, and a little bit of sand. So, uh, but it's clay are, are dominating, and um, uh, it's some soil which are very uh, with very low evolution. So it's mainly the effect of the subsoil and the, the geological aspects that uh, um, are, that express in the, in the wine, and it's not very um, uh, the, the wines can the, the wines can take quite a lot of water in this type of soil, so very uh, um, very moderate stress, low to moderate stress, but very uh, low nitrogen uh, availability. So it is because of this very um, low nitrogen availability that the, we, the, this wine will have some um, quite good structure, quite a lot of tannin, and, uh, but we, you have to, to be a passion to, uh, to, to harvest them. And uh, this, uh, this passion is moderate by the fact that they are very well exposed on the south uh, slope, south coast of uh, this right bank. Nearly the same age, it is uh, the clay from uh, Petrus. So it is um, uh, some heavy clay with very low level of limestone in. Uh, it's um, among um, uh, gravel terraces. It's because when the gravel uh, deposits on this clay, because the gravel are more young, are younger, and with some, you can you have to imagine that some in glossary period uh, there was some heavy um, um, uh, amount of uh, ice on this gravel. It creates some very big pressure, and there's some sort of bubble of clay that came inside the gravel. And uh, so that's why on Petrus you are just on this bubble of uh, of clay. And it's very, very heavy clay, um, uh, about 50% uh, of clay. So it's very difficult for the, for the roots to find hair inside. So it's a first stress. So that creates some tannin. 
uh, it will stress um, tannin because uh, lack of oxygen in the subsoil, because very little porosity, heavy clay, and then um, low level nitro uh, low uh, level of uh, nitrogen. So second qualitative aspect, and has the, the the clay are very present, they fix the water so strongly that it is difficult for the roots to take it. So it's a mix of very powerful wine because of the clay, which creates some um, um, lack of oxygen that um, it's good to, to, for the vines to synthesize, synthesize some, some uh, tannin. And because of this amount of clay, the water is so strongly fixed by the clay that uh, vines can have some uh, hydric stress, moderate hydric stress for ripening. So you have a mix of condition creating a lot of tannin and also uh, it weak situation that makes this tanning very soft. So it is something which is really good for, for the, especially for the Merlot. It's a brilliant description. I, I'm, you're, that, I think that was one of my favorite descriptions of Petrus. That idea of the bubble coming up between the two gravels is great because right next door, Le Fleur has got quite a bit of gravel. But I am conscious that we are close, we're just going over where we should be. So can we just more briefly, it's not you David, you're, that's brilliant, yes. just with the timing, just more briefly talk about the, the gravel and the calcosol, the, the last. Yes. So, so calcosol is the, the next step. So it is a limestone uh, deposit on the uh, under the sea. Uh, because of tect tectonic, it becomes on the top part and because it's very uh, uh, hard, it, is, it has been not uh, destroyed by erosion. So it's some soils very, uh, very narrow and um, um, very sh shallow root system. And uh, so you can have some effect of clay and effect of hydric stress, moderate hydric stress, because the, the root system is very, uh, very shallow. Uh, so it's, uh, but it has it is heavy clay, um, has, there's a lot of clay in the top soil. It makes time, quite a long time for ripening. So that's why it's not so, early ripening than, for example, Lafitte, and um, um, more, which is really defined by the gravel. As it's gravelly soil, it's early bud burst, it's early ripening because of hydric stress. So it's really uh, the top soil for Cabernet Sauvignon, because as you know, uh, in Bordeaux area, Cabernet Sauvignon it is the latest uh, varieties we have to, to we, we use. And um, because of that, we have to plant them on the earlier ripening soil. And so um, shallow um, gravelly soil on the left bank, but also on the right bank, as you told before, uh, especially in, in uh, west of saint emilion and also in the biggest part of Pomerol, you, you, will, you will find this type of gravelly soil and you have some hydric stress that makes this situation really great for the, the Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, it doesn't mean that it, it's not good for Merlot. It means that it is really on this part that the Cabernet Sauvignon gives the best result because of hydric stress and early ripening. It's so, so good. Thank you. Really, really clear. And this is, you know, this is one of the things that is so interesting about this terroir approach. You really start to dig down into the different personalities. And what I like about that is it tells you what it will fit, what it will taste like. And that's really at the end of the day what we want to know. Okay, so I'm not going to do these last two, next two slides because time-wise, and basically we've been talking about that. And in fact, <laughs> temperature, This we'll, we could go over with this as well, but let's just quickly talk about temperature. So right at the beginning, Debbie said that as we can see, that there, is a, there are different soil types and location will change the temperature variation. So what do you guess, people, about the variation in temperature between different parts of the Bordeaux region? Okay, and as you're quite right, it's 71% of you were right. It's, um, it's 1.5 and actually I think it can even go higher. But one of the things that's fascinating, if we just quickly go on to the next one, is that there is a consistency to how the temperature changes. So we talk about um, vintages being got warm or cold and, and rainy or sunny, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that's fascinating, and, and I want us to talk about here about the future of Bordeaux terroir, is that there are, there's a consistency. Sorry, if I just, for, for me for one second, if we just go back to that last map, I just mean we'll bring those two things together. This is a map by a guy called Benjamin Bois, who did this research 
And what he found was exactly as David said earlier, that um, there are certain parts of Bordeaux that no matter what in, in warm vintages or cold vintages are systematically warmer. So close to the city center, Pesat Leonia, that will consistently be warmer. Um, Pomerol, because it's on this kind of riverbed, the Isle riverbed where you have gravels and the clay, it's consistently warmer than um, Castillon or Fronzac, et cetera. Over on the right, on the left bank, this kind of strip that you can see, obviously the reds are the warmer bits, this kind of strip along the river, which where most of the, um, the, the 61 classified growths are, tend to be in this warmer strip along the river. Borg and Bly, which is on the, the opposite side, opposite Margot, again, you have this strip along the river where it's warm. And, and, you, and conversely, you can see here where the green is, where it's the coolest bit. So right, right, right over saint foy la grande um, Castillon, et cetera, it starts to get cooler. In the Northern Medoc over on the left bank, it starts to get cooler. Now, if we just switch on to the next, to the next slide and talk about the terroir, the really interesting thing about that is it can help you to find where you want to find nice wines or you know, wines that have been successful in different, um, in different vintages. But what it can also do, and where I'd like to ask David about this, is the, in the future, as climate change is having an impact, do you think that certain parts of Bordeaux, where it was an advantage to be warm, is it becoming difficult for them? Is it becoming a handicap to be warm? And yes, Wendy, please come in and ask those questions too. <laughs> um, first, what I would like to say um, is that the actual evolution is um, clearly an advantage uh, to create, to, to produce um, more regularly some good or very good vintages. So it is very clear, you can see that for the last uh, 10, uh, 10 years, um, we have more regularly some uh, very good vintage now than 30 or 40 years ago. Um, so we have more regularly some very good ripening for Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Sauvignon is one of the, of the, 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 the um, is part of the heart of, uh, of um, Bordeaux. And to have the chance to produce more regularly some very good um, ripening rip, rip Cabernet Sauvignon is really something um, which is uh, encouraging for um, the, the future. Um, you, you wrote about, about Merlot on some very specific, um, and more Merlot on clay, because we can see, uh, for example, on the last on uh, 2018, uh, 19, and 20, because of hydric stress, Merlot on uh, gravelly soil doesn't reach so high level of alcohol because hydric stress at the moment redu reduces the photosynthesis and it makes some, uh, it doesn't uh, go uh, above uh, 14 degrees of alcohol, percent of alcohol. Hey, I'm going to have to interrupt because I know we've only got a few minutes. You've actually answered more or less all the questions that everybody <laughs> everybody asked, which is great. But there was one question I think was particularly interesting. But there was lots of interesting questions, so I apologise to people who um, won't get answers this evening. But um, clarification on the difference between um, Cabernet on gravel, and um, which means we have softer tannins earlier, but then the question mark has been raised but Merlot is earlier ripening so how, how does that work the Merlot on clay and, and the Cabernet on, gra on gravel as far as the, the Cabernet on, 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 on gravel on Merlot on clay they are very close uh, ripening in fact especially Merlot on limestone so for example for, for instance uh, uh, even this year on property, for example, in, in saint Estef, where you can find on the same property some limestone and some very uh, gravelly soil. Uh, we will pick up uh, some Cabernet Sauvignon on gravelly soil before the latest mel ripening uh, Merlot on the limestone. So it's really it's something which is quite new because uh, as uh, Jane uh, told before, before it was about uh, we start here and we finish there every year is nearly the same way. So now we really, we are very um, precise on the white ripening on each part of uh, each property. So it makes something like that. Cabernet on gravelly soil sometimes pick up before some mellow on limestones. 
That's, that's very interesting. I've got a very controversial question, but I'm going to throw it out there quickly. Um, based on all this new information that we have about terroir, will there ever be a reclassification of Bordeaux based uniquely on terroir? I think we can say no. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah. um, <laughs> Jane told before, it's not just by chance that some are first growth and other. It's a question of uh, historical um, uh, image of their wine, and uh, there's no mystery. Uh, the quality is really first linked to the, the ability of the soil to produce the great berries and, and great wine. You're right. So I guess in one way we can say there has already been a classification of Bordeaux done on its terroir in, in that it was a huge part of why the wine was good and why it was selling well. But I would say to specifically do it, we've all seen the Santamillion issues of, of redoing classifications and now people are very happy to call their lawyer and see. So I, I'm, I think we'll be waiting a long time before there's an official reclassification. That's a very good answer, Jane. Um, I just wanted to pop on um, because it's the top of the hour. So I wanted to thank everyone for joining joining us, Eva, uh, and thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I'm also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com. If you enjoyed what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe to help others find me more easily. And most importantly, tell your wine-loving friends, because if you like the podcast, they will too. Podcast music is Wine by Kevens. Until next week, slancha. Temprani, you all the lovely bar.